In today's episode, we interview Father Justin Brunn, a priest of the Diocese of Tyler. He shares a lot of really great stories, including an experience with Eucharistic adoration. And he shares his wisdom with how to increase Eucharistic devotion in our own lives, in the lives of our family. Trust me, this is one you don't want to miss. We hope that you enjoy. Welcome to Life Beyond the Chariot, a faith and family series from the St. Philip Institute. We believe we are called to not only know, but also to live the truth of the gospel within our homes, in our workplaces, and beyond. We believe we are invited to encounter Christ in the messiness of day-to-day life and to live as his disciples. Welcome back, friends. It's good to see you. We are wrapping up our Eucharist series with a very special guest, our chaplain of the St. Philip Institute and pastor at Sacred Heart in Texarkana, Father Justin Braun. How are you, Father? Stupendous. Hey. (laughs) Really. Glad to be with you, ladies. Good. It's Uh, good to have you back. It's been like a year. It's been a really long time. I had to say, when the intro was playing, both of y'all were bobbing your heads, and I'm like, just don't (laughs) laugh. It was great. I'm just so happy that we're here. (laughs) Yes. And so the last several weeks on the St. Philip Institute podcast and Life Beyond the Chariot, we've been diving into the Eucharist. And our last episode, we were talking about just practical applications for uh, surviving mass with Mm -hmm. children. And we thought that it would be a really good perspective to talk to Father Braun, um, beloved pastor of the Diocese of Tyler, um, to really get your pastoral perspective on the Eucharist and Eucharistic devotion. And we've spoken to Bishop Strickland about the year of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Eucharist and asked him, you know, what did he hope for the diocese uh, as far as what we would receive from this year. But from your perspective as a pastor, what are you hoping that your parishioners um, receive from this year? Well, first and foremost, renewed devotion. And that's a funny word for people. What does devotion mean? And as best I can, you know, kind of look at what I've seen devotion in my own experience as a cradle Catholic in East Texas and seeing, you know, the benefit of getting to go in different places in the world, devotion is the external expression of the interior motions. So there's an interior motion of the heart that's stirred, and we want to express that in some way physically, whether it's verbally or through our hands or in some way just to give attention to God. And so to renew devotion in the people of God in my parish, what I'm hoping to see is an increase in Eucharistic piety. Um, And what does that mean? It means just that there's more reverence for the Eucharist, for the presence of our Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist and to see an increase in time before him in the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, I love that expression. I can't remember which saint it was, but uh, that he's a prisoner of love, Mm -hmm. and he's just always there waiting to be visited. And, you know, I have the benefit. I live 26 feet from the door of my church, so I get to see him all the time. And uh, what's been enheartening to me has already to see increased devotion just even in the past uh, few months, Uh, to see our people making more efforts to make those daily visits. A lot of dads and moms popping in on their lunch break or after work before Mm -hmm. they go home. That's been really cool to see. Um, And with Our Lady, you know, it's always kind of a connection that, for me, coming from a a parish called St. Mary's and uh, really sitting in the Adoration Chapel as a a young person, um, there was images of Our Lady kind of in that chapel. And and so I always think of Mary as the mother of the Eucharist because she's the mother of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. So making that connection more real and and having the ability to convey that devotionally has has practically meant some formation in the parish. So sure, I preach and teach, but teaching specifically on the Eucharist, teaching specifically on Marian dogma and devotion, and increasing that. And, And we, you know, I'm fortunate, very fortunate to have a very faithful parish where the people love to be fed. And as soon as they're fed, they're ready to do more. And so it's been a, yeah, it's been a really cool thing to see so far this year, what we've done, just some practical things that maybe some priests that are listening or parishioners who want to bother your priests, please do. (laughs) Um, You're our children. We want to hear from you. But uh, 
So at Advent, we began on Friday night at 8 p.m. into Saturday morning at 9 a.m. doing overnight adoration. We called it uh, O Holy Night. You know, kind of fits with the Advent season. And then for Lent, we've been doing that, and our Lord says famously in uh, Matthew's Gospel, can you not spend an hour mm-hmm. with me? Mm-hmm. So to use that that focus of the liturgy to draw in uh, people to this nocturnal adoration, um, and hey, guess what? It I didn't know if it would work, and in spades. We've got people every hour. I typically take the 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. hour uh, as a good, I think, a good nice. father. You go when you go when nobody else wants to go. <laughs> and again, the convenience of living right there yeah. is pretty high. But I'm always amazed. Every time I go in, there's there's three or four, sometimes up to, there was one time I went in there and it was, it was like 22 people. I was like, wow. what's going on? So that was just so that's cool. Amazing. And so that's one thing we're doing practically. Um, and then we're going to be doing in the month of May, we do a Mary, Marian crowning, but we're going to start to add a Marian uh, litany at the end of our Saturday morning mass. Nice. Uh, so we'll pray the litany of Loretto, and we'll once May hits, that's going to be every Saturday for, I, I hope, until Jesus comes again in glory. Nice. And so we're going to do those two things practically, and then some catechesis and just in, in encouraging. We have the rosary before every mass, every mass, every daily mass, every Sunday mass. So that's already going on. And in the month of October, I, I did a series on this last year, kind of anticipating this was going to happen this year, but I'm going to do it again on Our Lady of Sorrows to encourage mm. devotion to the Blessed Mother of, of the Seven Sorrows. So, nice. Yeah, that's um, what's going on. I just told my people love Jesus and Mary more. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's the real answer to that question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's so great to um, – and hear that, that you have noticed already um, a tan- like tangibly an increase – in that in your parish already, which is amazing and so um, inspirational to me. Uh, and I guess just out of curiosity, like on a personal level, your relationship with Mary in the Eucharist, is there anything that has happened in the course of your life that was a catalyst for um, a deeper understanding or a deeper love? Yes. Uh I'll, I'll go ahead and indulge. We were going to maybe cover some of this later, but I'll, 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 I'll the story really, because it's the story of how my, my vocation began. Mm. Um, and shout out to my mom. I talked to her like as I was driving up here uh, <laughs> to, to come do this podcast. But when I was 14, um, as I said, I went to St. Mary's in Longview. And 12 to 13 to 14 was my rough years. Uh, I, I lived around kids that were a couple years older than me, so I kind of jumped into being a full-blown crazy teenager, a little <laughs> on the early side. Um, and thankfully, uh, I said my mom and uh, my my pastor and uh, our associate, actually Father Denzel. Father Denzel is a priest of the Blessed Sacrament uh, religious order, and so when he got there uh, as associate, he started doing perpetual adoration mm-hmm. and preached it. And you know, we 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 woke up this just beast that was just lying dormant and people were going to adoration and I didn't know what it was and you know I was 14 I didn't care uh to be honest it's like okay great people are going to church um but my mom in her wisdom was like hey you're an idiot um (laughs) and I love you but you're acting really poorly uh so I'm gonna it's kind of a punishment but it was go to adoration and at first, I was very resistant, um, not just because it was an hour of my time, but I just really didn't understand what was going on. Um, so I would go to adoration with my mom, and we had the 10 o'clock, it was 9 to 10 or 10 to 11, I don't remember, but it was Thursday nights. Um, and the first like solid month I was there, I kid you not, I went in with a discman, <laughs> Uh, which some of you may not even know what that is, but you put a disc, a, like a CD in there, and you put your headphones on, and I would listen to Metallica's like black album awesome. with like Inner Sandman, just jamming out with with Metallica. Our Lord is twenty seven feet away from me, and I just sit there and look at him. I had nothing else, no Bible, no catechism, nothing. My mom is up there on her knees praying the Rosary, and I'm just there. And over time, you know. I, it was my mom's prayers. I have the greatest confidence in that. Um, I'm a little teary-eyed. But I just turned the music off. Mm. I was like, all right, I don't get it, but there's something, and not just something, but someone is staring me in the face, mm. and I think that's God. And I started to just shut up. 
And what I was doing was making a lot of noise at first, right? So I can't hear anything, can't hear Jesus talk to me. And I just shut up, and I started to look into his eyes, and he started to stare right back at me. Mm. And that little image of my mom, you know, in the front pew, me in the back pew, her praying a rosary, and that was what got me to understand that our our mother in heaven, she wants me to go to her son. Because mm. my mom modeled that to me. Wow. <laughs> Literally. And, uh, yeah, I, I get chills thinking about it because I love my mom so much. But that's what hooked me. And so being there, I just being able to be present to the Lord and the Lord being present to me, I started to learn the devotion of the rosary, the, the scriptures, um, and that, you know, started this just deep fire in my heart that's just, it still burns with, I, I hope people can see it in my priestly life. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, I love our Lord and our Lady so much. And fast forward a little bit, as a priest, you know, people constantly kind of ask me, Father, what do you do to pray? What do you do to pray? And it, there's a lot of things I, I do in prayer, gosh, and some of them I'm still figuring out. But a constant for me over the course of, you know, what's, I'm 39 now, so 25 years of real serious prayer, it's been the rosary. Mm-hmm. And she just keeps drawing me back to her son whenever I act like an idiot. <laughs> yeah. so. uh, thank you so much You're for welcome. sharing that story. And yeah. there's so much in there. I think, one, I think it gives hope to a lot of moms mm. <laughs> who don't know how to bring their children uh, to our Lord. And I am a strong believer that there is an extra oomph behind a mom's prayers yep. <laughs> and, um, and especially in, in bringing, yeah, just bringing our children before the Lord. And, and I know that there's a lot of moms who are just parents who are struggling with knowing well, specifically with their teens. Cause we've talked a lot about like, how do you get through mass with a three and four year old yeah. or the, the <laughs> elementary age, but teenagers have a different attitude that can, can come up. So what type of encouragement can you offer to parents who have older kids who are now maybe a little more vocal about not wanting to go or, um, yeah, just <clears throat> the the unique challenges that come with trying to raise a, a Catholic teen nowadays. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, first, just to tell you ladies, you know, I know it's somewhat in the future for all of you. It's coming. It's, it's coming, though. I'm going to have four teenagers um, at you once. You are at once. It's, you're, Wait, can you're, we do a kid exchange? <laughs> like, right. all right, you're going to go to Miss Johnson's house. <laughs> Your food bills are going to be so high. Yeah. Um, so first and foremost, I'd say, do not waver. Hmm. And I mean that. Those kids need to be in church. I, I can say that with great confidence. I have two sisters who have nine kids, and all of them go to Mass, regardless of how much they want to complain, because guess what? Jesus is more important than your feelings. Hmm. And that's what it boils down to. You're, if you're going to let yourself be dominated by your child's feelings or your teenager's feelings, Mass is not the only area you're going to have problems right. in. And so I think it, it, it's two moms to, to say persevere, and to dads, don't be weak on this. Um, and, and the proof's in the pudding, you know, consistently kids who continue to go throughout their high school years, if they have a mom and a dad who are doing their part, they're going to stay faithful. They may, they're going to struggle like any kid, but, but I, can't, and I can't say it enough, just keep going. But what other things can you do? Like, I, I think... As I work with teenagers all the time. I was just telling the ladies about how I was with my our teenage girls from our youth group last night. And um, I think it's so important for parents of teenagers to let them ask questions. Yeah. And this is where I, I always tease my brothers-in-law. You've got to be, you know, you have hobbies. And so one brother-in-law, he loves, he loves cars. One brother-in-law, he loves beer. Uh, he <laughs> brews beer. Uh, both of them have hobbies that are perfectly healthy and normal. It was like, your hobby is a hobby. It, it, it doesn't lead to your child's salvation. It doesn't hinder their salvation. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you knowing about the Mass, you knowing about why yeah. Jesus is important, you have to have answers for those questions. And, and mom doesn't need to be the only one putting up that fight. So ladies, mm-hmm. just get your husbands to get involved in these questions. But, uh, but particularly because I know that, that we want to talk to moms, uh, think about what you can do as setting an example to them in the mass, uh, 
you know, if you're if you're one of those moms who never sings, who never responds, your kids are watching you, um, and y'all know because you got littles. They're really watching you, and if you're not into it, it's really easy for them to not be into it and to kind of accuse you of that and say, "Well, mom, you don't. You just show up and you sit there, right?" Mm-hmm. So you're you're literally your body language makes a difference, um, but engage the questions. Make sure you're participating fully consciously and actively in the liturgy itself. Uh, and, and thirdly, and this is a little bit more particular to moms, is I think you've got a, a great opportunity to be in their <clears throat> because you see your kids a little bit more typically mm-hmm. than, than the husbands might see in, in most in many families. But um, you have an opportunity to follow up with them a little bit more. Um, and so on the drive back from mass, while you're, you know, if this happens in your car, you're, you're giving Cheerios, you're giving, milk, but, <laughs> but if you got some teens, you're not feeding them. They're just stuck on their phone. You, you say after mass, no phones on the drive home. Let's just talk about what the readings are about. Let's talk about father's homily, but making it more than just go to the church, check that box and walk away, mm-hmm. May, making it an intentional opportunity to talk to them about Hey, here's what did you get yeah. out of that? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and then I, I do think there's a benefit of just being exposed to uh, like other parishes or uh, or going to like a, a youth retreat um, where kids are going to be around other ki- teenagers, particularly going to be around other teenagers who are falling falling in love with Jesus or don't love Jesus, and maybe it's going to be their opportunity to encounter him. But there's something very powerful about that witness of other teens, and I know. You worked with teenagers for mm-hmm. 15 years, yeah. you know, teaching, yeah. and, and you you know the power of a retreat for a kid can be oh, absolutely. so immense. Yeah. So those are some of the basics I would start with. Yeah. Thanks. Mm-hmm. One of the things that you had mentioned in your story, in your story about um, your mom and adoration, which first of all, I just love the way that you speak about your mom. Yes. <laughs> um, I think it's beautiful, and I don't know if this is like selfish, but I'm like, oh, it'd be great if my kids are talking about like that. You're talking mm. about me like that when they're, um, you know, our age, they but will. it's just beautiful. And but one of the things that you said in your story um, was that you know you would you'd be listening to your CD player mm. and your disman. Um, did your mom know? And what was her response? Because I could see me as a mom, like if I'm bringing my kid, um, and they're just like, you know, I could see myself <laughs> getting upset. Worked up. And then yeah. what? So what did your mom do? And then what advice would you give, like when you do bring your child, no matter what age, and either the behavior or they're doing something that you're like, I don't know if this is okay. Like Mm. in those moments, what would you say is the best guidance? Well, I'll give you the example of what my mom did. So my mom just said, come with me, right? Mm. She didn't put any restrictions on it. She didn't, she just said, you're going to come with me. And so that kind of left it open and... Did my mom know? Yeah, she knew. Because I probably had it so loud she could hear it, you know. <laughs> Exit light. You know, but she didn't stop me because she knew I was there. Um, now, I think if my mom, if you asked her point blank, she'd probably say, yeah, I didn't like that. And, and that, that's true. Um, I think it's a different story today, too, because our kids are exposed to so much yeah. media, mm-hmm. like with the screens, the yeah. noise, that... I, I think she would have taken a harder line in, in, that, in that sense. But I've been around adoration chapels for 25 years, right? And so I've seen a lot of moms bring their kids in. And uh, and, and one of the neatest things I think that I've seen is bring them in there, go to that front pew or those kneelers, wherever you're at, have them kneel with you, pray a decade of the rosary or whatever, and then let them – kind of figure out their own space. Now, if there's a bunch of other people in there, you, you got to be conscientious of those yeah, other people. Right. But if it's your hour, right, or if y'all just pop into the church for like 10 minutes. Uh, right now, I've got, yeah, I've got a mom who's got a two-and-a-half-year-old and like a nine-month-old. They come in for like 12 minutes. And basically, the girls kind of just murmur. Mm-hmm. She's just there. But she's kneeling and holding, you know, the nine-month-old and little Felicity, she just kind of coos and walks around. And it's really sweet. But Felicity comes in and says the prayers. She may be mm-hmm. walking around a little bit, but she's saying, Hail Mary, full of grace. That it's is just, so cute. It's the best. It melts my heart every Aww. time. But I do think 
the less screen. So, you know, it's really hard when they're three, four, five, but you've got readers, five-year-olds and up. They're, mm-hmm. they're, even if it's really basic words. So bring your mass books with them. Mm-hmm. Bring their children's Bibles. If they're going to do something, do something that's Christ-oriented. Um, and, uh, you know, is the mid nineties, there was not a lot of Christ oriented media, right? <laughs> right? Now you can, you could, yeah. you could bring in an iPad with a, a Christian movie yeah. even yeah. and say, Hey, I just want you to sit, you know, mom's going to sit here for 15 minutes, pray a decade of the rosary, give yourself 10 minutes of quiet, put the headphones on your kid and let them watch a, a Bible story. I don't think there's any harm in that, mm-hmm. but you're acclimating them more and more mm, to that, right. that, that space in which they're present to Christ. Yeah, and the fruit that comes from that, I mean, you're a priest. <laughs> you're sitting in Metallica yeah. in front of the Blessed Sacrament. <laughs> I mean, the, the, we will never know probably just the, the impact of just bringing our kids mm-hmm. before our Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, th- and that's, I think that's the thing that is so encouraging um, for us as parents are the things that we have to cling to is that we are planting seeds. God causes the growth, but we're planting seeds and to just bring our children before our Lord and to let him encounter our kids. Because I know like Eucharistic Adoration, I encountered that for the first time in Catholic school and we did First Friday Adoration and I just over time just picking up slowly on, on what that means and seeing the impact on my own family. And I know we've talked a lot about, you know, helping our children to to increase Eucharistic devotion. This has been really encouraging. But I guess even just turning towards parents or towards adults, um, because I know, like, I can't remember the specific statistic, but it's it's a uh, a very sad number of Catholics don't believe in the true presence of the Eucharist, right? Or we struggle. 71%. With yeah, it's sad. Wow. <laughs> um, but what encouragement can you offer to just those of us who may be struggling with the true presence in the Eucharist or even just increasing Eucharistic devotion in ourselves mm. um, or struggling to believe or not really feeling because there is this emphasis on the emotion. Like I don't get yeah. any emotion out of coming to Mass or I don't get any emotion out of sitting before the Blessed Sacrament. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I And I, I can sympathize. Again, 25 years of pretty serious prayer in my life, there's definitely been periods where I'm like, gosh, dude, I know you're there, but it is – it's a struggle. Dry. Yeah. It's dry. It just, I'm listening and I'm not hearing anything. Um, so one of the things that I think helps with remote preparation is like, and it's, and I, I know it's very hard. Again, I have siblings, two sisters who have 10 kids realistically between them. One of them's already a grandma. The other one's going to be a grandma <laughs> soon. Like mm. these ladies have kids have been a part of their life <laughs> and been a big part of my life. But my sister with six kids, she gets to mass 30 minutes early every Sunday. And she's done that since like kid one. Mm. Um, so the insistence that remotely you need to prepare yourself, you need to give yourself more time mm. to make an emphasis that this is important thing. Yeah. This is not just a thing that we do out of custom. It's something that is important to me. And, and given that you're going to get to mass, you've got four littles, you got three, you got not so little, but you got yeah. three. Uh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's so tall. Uh, her oldest daughter, or her only daughter. So, so tall. tall. Yeah. Um, but you get there and you give by by putting importance to hey we're we're not showing up right on time we're showing mm-hmm. up early that helps and that helps you interiorly to yeah. think okay i'm prioritizing in a remote way i'm prioritizing the immediate reality of christ by preparing my heart and ordering our lives towards yeah. that right so if god is really the source and summit of our life in the eucharist how does our all of our actions around that indicate that that's the reality so there, there's a little bit of remote preparation in the immediate moment, one of the best kind of pieces of advice a spiritual director gave me, because in seminary, I tried to pray two holy hours every day. Because uh, guess what? We had time. <laughs> Any seminarian who says they don't, they're a liar. Um, I hope That's you're listening. Hardcore. Um, and really, even as priests, we do have time. I prioritize prayer above all else, because mm. I, can't, I can't be a good father to you if I'm not in touch with the Father, right? Mm. But one of the best pieces of advice he gave me was he just said, you know, when you're in the in the presence of the Lord, whether he's in the tabernacle or in the monstrance, you've got to treat him like a friend who you just like being in the presence of. Mm. And, you know, love languages, both of you, I would guess, QT, quality time is probably a high, high maybe not yeah. your first, but it's up there. <laughs> it's up there. It's totally my first. And so I get that. I like to be in the presence of the people I love. Um, and I don't have to talk to them. They don't have to talk to me. I just want to, like 
being around my nephews and nieces who might be staring at their phones, but just being there with them is so cathartic and, and beautiful. And so when I'm struggling to feel that emotional connection, I, I got to remember like John chapter uh, 15, um, you know, that the vine and branches kind of comes back mm. to me like, I just need to abide in your love. Mm. And if I can abide and just be here, then it does. It totally can reset you. And just remember, you're in the presence of your best friend yeah, mm. who loves you more than you love yourself, yeah. right? And whew, you ladies are both married to very good men. Mm. You know how good it feels to be in their presence. I think of, you know, my dad. I think of my mom, the comfort of being in their presence. And, and that's magnified times a billion mm. by being in his presence. Mm. So if that helps, I would say that's a good place to start. Other thing is just make sure when you're in there, if you are really struggling for a couple of weeks or a couple of months even, bring good reading material, people. I've had... <laughs> You know, I've read for a whole hour sometimes, yeah. like 60 straight minutes. I'm just yeah. reading about God because guess what? It's about God, yeah. and at least it's getting my mind moved towards him. You know, hopefully that doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes that's okay. But good reading material means you're not reading The Brothers K. As much as a good book <laughs> as that is, you're not reading The Brothers K. You're reading something about Christ, something nice. about the saints, right? Nice. So those are some practical tips yeah, I can think helpful. of. No, I think that's great because I think, um, and I was even asked this by um, another mom, and she was like, "What do what do I tell? Like, what do what am I supposed to do in adoration? Like, yeah. what does that look like? Yeah. And what am I supposed to tell my kids they need to do in adoration?" Um, and so uh, I think sometimes the hesitation can be like, "I don't know what's like mm. appropriate protocol, mm. you yeah. know, for being in the sacred space." Yeah. Um, and that can, I think, keep a lot of people from... Just be there. Yeah. yeah. Really. Be with him. Just I just love be that. With him. Yeah. yeah. Be with him. He wants to be with you more than you could ever imagine. Mm. So just be there. So I know we have the, the Eucharistic Congress is something that's coming to our diocese and yeah. really a means by to, to encourage Eucharistic devotion among the people of Tyler. So as we're wrapping up, Father, could you just because you're heading up this this yeah. big event <laughs> and prayers with you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, like what is the Eucharistic Congress? Why should people go? What can they expect? Okay, the yeah. Stuff. So the Eucharistic Congress is an opportunity for the whole diocese to come together as a family. The, the theme is uh, the Eucharist, source and summit of family life. So really that emphasis of we want this to not just be a specialist kind of conference for only catechists or only dads or only moms. We want this for everybody. It's for all ages. Um but really to give an opportunity for us to enter into a kind of a diocesan retreat for about 24-ish hours of prayer. So the Eucharist, it'll begin with Mass, it'll end with Mass in a procession, and the Eucharist will be exposed the whole time. Mm -hmm. So people from all over our diocese can come to the mother city of, of our diocese, come to Tyler, starts June 10th in the evening at 6 p.m., that's a Friday, and we'll go through um, 6 p.m. Mass on Saturday with a procession to follow. But it's really a time in which we can engage our intellect. So there is a, there's a lot of good, just really good speakers. Archbishop Cordelione from San Francisco, uh, Father Castro with Miles Christi will be doing the Spanish track. Uh, we have young adult speakers of whom includes Sister Josephine, one of my favorite human beings in the world. <laughs> Ours too. Uh, she's so good. Patrick Glaze is a former focus missionary, and he's just fire. He's so fun. And, and I'll be speaking to. And then we've got a, an optional track for the way of beauty to really emphasize this connection between beauty and worship. Yeah. Um, so we'll have some great speakers talking about that that particular philosophical and theological connection. Um, and then some catechesis that's going to be run by this sweet lady uh, for <laughs> first else? through uh, sixth grade. And uh, so just opportunities for that formation. But really the, the biggest benefit, I think, is this is being offered in this year of the Eucharist and the Immaculate Virgin Mary as a way of giving a center to our diocesan life. Mm. Like if, if Eucharist and Our Lady are not the center of our lives, then what are we doing? Right. Yeah. right. So it'll be, you know, really easy to access. Uh, the website, I think, will be in the show notes. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, it's 15 bucks. Uh, if you got to drive from out of town, you got to rent a hotel, that's that's the price you pay, but I think it's very much worth it. Yes. Yeah. I'm coming from Texarkana, which is two hours from Tyler, <laughs> um, and I'll probably be sleeping on the floor of some rectory because we don't have, you know. <laughs> but just the opportunity for us as a diocesan family to to engage seriously the gift of our faith in the Eucharist, to learn, to pray together, uh, and to benefit from that both that formation and that worship that we offer that, that's being offered. It's going to be straight fire, it's as the kids say. Yeah, yeah it's going to be so awesome. much fun. 
Okay. I'm excited. So yeah, we'll have the the link in the show notes. Register by the time this episode comes out, the registration will be open yeah. for it. And yeah, it's gonna be really great. I'm really, really looking excited. forward to. It. I first one I've ever been to. I've yeah. never been to a Eucharistic yeah. Congress before. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. there's. There's two dioceses, uh, so Atlanta and our Archdiocese of Atlanta and the Diocese of Charlotte who do one every year, and theirs are like, like twenty thousand people. It's wow. massive. I don't, wow. I, I don't, I hope we have as many as we can, but <laughs> we don't have great. accommodations for twenty thousand people anywhere in the <laughs> city of Tyler. So, out. but just to, yeah, just to really, really give us an opportunity as a family, I think uh, a diocesan family to focus on what matters the most, Christ and, and the, the, the blessing of the Mass, the blessing of our families, mm. um, which is a sign of God's kingdom, right? That we're, we're kingdom people, um, and you're living it, and you're in the kingdom of your home yes. as a domestic church. Uh, but the, the, the church as is, the kind of institutional church, is here to support you. Mm. So this is one of the best ways we could do that. And I'm very grateful Bishop gave me the responsibility to be the coordinator. It's been a fun you know, opportunity. This is like the ninth conference I've organized for our diocese. So at this point, I'm just really, I'm waiting for that new, that new young priest that I can say here. <laughs> Take the baton. Take the baton, buddy. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much yeah. for being no, here, you. Father. Yeah. It is always a gift to have you with us. And we encourage our listeners to uh, check out the rest of the series if this is the first episode that you're seeing. Um, Dr. Luke Arredondo has done a phenomenal job yeah. of unpacking the, the catechesis on the Eucharist and the parts of the Mass all of these things, and Mickey and I will always bring you the perspective from wives and moms. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, we'll we'll be keeping all of you in our prayers. Uh, we'll have a little bit of a break, uh, mm-hmm. and we'll be jumping back in towards the end of May. Uh, but yeah, Father, will you give us your blessing as we be happy up? to? With the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. God Almighty, Father, who have given us all the good gifts that we need to continue our path towards your kingdom. We ask you, Lord, to bless us in this time of Lent, to strengthen our resolve to live out uh, the promises and resolutions of our Lent, and to bring us to the joy of Easter, when we can cry out with the whole church, Alleluia, Alleluia. And through the imposition of my priestly hands, the intercession of Mary, Mother, St. Joseph, her spouse, and all the saints, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.